Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta, part two of our discussion. And yes, in serious and the Dogon people, and I'm like geeking out over here because <laughs> y'all, I love a good deep dive. I'm like the Nancy Drew of, of weird shit. I loved, I mean, this is only one bookcase. <laughs> I just find the mystery of of us humans as we spoke about last week to be just so incredible and the more you deep dive into a specific culture i feel like the more you realize how truly alike we all are regardless of what your race is regardless of what your heritage is we all have more in common than we do um differences and so i am just i'm stoked about this I literally nerded out and um, I did a deep dive into the Dogon people. And we're going to talk about that today. And I thank you, Hillis. I thank you so much for bringing this up last week when we started talking about Sirius and the star system Sirius, because this is unbelievable what, what, what these people, I hate saying that these people, that what this, this group of humans, this tribe of humans have really maintained for all of us. And I don't even think they realize that they have held on to this. Really, they are going to be the um, protectors or they are the protectors of our true history. Yeah, because, you know, if anyone has experienced plant medicine, you know, and you go to these through these rituals and there have been people who I've talked to, and they talk about the history globally and most of which obviously isn't written down. And when you hear the origin stories of humanity and how each one of a different color or a different hue, if you will, in this case, would go off in a different direction and start a civilization and it would just radiate out from there. And as we tend to learn about the true history orally, as we step into that library that is within us, you know, that's in our cell, that's in our DNA, as we connect to the history, we then begin to question what is the truth of humanity, or who are we in, in the sense of, well, yeah, I know I'm Black, okay, but that I'm more than just Black, yeah. okay, I have an Irish, okay, I'm more than just that. And what I have discovered, you know, not only about the Dogon tribe, but also it's more about, and I think I mentioned it briefly last week, is the soul lineage of self, and not the yeah. ancestry, but the ancestry of self. Meaning it's not about your father or your mother or their parents or their parents' parents or your cousin, uncles. It's about none of that. It's all about you, yeah. how you connect to them. Absolutely. And that is what when we, um, I mean, Sri Swami Satyananda says this in his commentary, when you start to recognize that soul power over everything, that's when true love radiates because you don't see a person anymore. I mean, obviously, yeah, when you meet a person, you you notice things, their hair color, their skin color, their eye color, that's how you're, you identify who they are. But it doesn't matter because you actually see the soul radi radiating through that person, that being. And that's what's really important. But I asked you before we started, Hillis, if you had ever heard of Tartaria. And that we have talked about a lot on my channel. And I there are channels out there that are totally dedicated strictly to, to, tar to, tar to Tartaria. And what I've learned in relationship to other cases. Um, and so I'm just going to give you guys a brief Cliff Notes version of Tartaria. Um, if, if, uh, again, if you, this is the first time you're hearing it, I would highly suggest just looking at there's channels totally dedicated where they do tons of research into this time period. So I'm going to start by saying that if we think about history and dates, we know, we, we know logically that our dates are not probably not accurate. Like people like Cleopatra what in sitting in Egypt going, wow, it's 50 BC. I can't wait for next year it to be 49 BC. Like, no, <laughs> we, we ended up in our modern time creating this system. And, and it works for the purpose of us categorizing ancient history, modern, you know, for us to kind of understand when, you know, from a, from a scholarly perspective, an academic perspective, when certain ages happened, all that kind of stuff, so we can study the evolution of consciousness. Well, the Cassiopeians have said this, and I think people are starting to kind of figure this out, that there are a thousand years 
on our timeline that are kind of unaccounted for. And so basically what the history that we have, some of it happened and some of it didn't happen. For example, people are now, the Tartarian experts are now questioning whether Napoleon really existed or not. So there are some literal historic people that some of these Tartarian experts are like, I don't know if this person actually existed. Um, and with that being said, the historic events that are, are given to them, what was that really? And so basically the history that we have that's correct, it happened in a shorter uh, time frame, And the 1,000 years that are missing are what these Tartarian experts call Tartaria. This was the age of Tartaria. And so what really got me on this, there is a great documentary. It's like seven hours. Um, I'll send it to you when we get off uh, Hillis. And the guy posed a lot of very, very interesting questions that make you kind of scratch your head. Now, Hillis, have you ever been to Washington, D.C.? I have, but it's been so long ago. Right. I was there last summer. And after I had studied the Tartarian stuff, I realized being in Washington, D.C., that this guy was right. D.C. is a Tartarian city. It wasn't built the way we think it was built. It wasn't built by a bunch of men in a horse-drawn carriage without any electric uh, equipment. Right? There's, It's just no way. And you go to, like, the Lincoln Memorial, and you walk into it, and you realize that it says temple on the side. And there are people that have discovered there's actually floors underneath the Lincoln Memorial that we have not been aware of, which is big with Tartaria because of the mud floods. So basically, Tartaria, all of these cathedrals we see, all of that were Tartarian buildings. They were built, it was, this was a thousand years of peace. And so basically the assumption, the theory with Tartaria, if you look at the Bible, which the only book of the Bible that I take remotely serious is the book of Revelation. The rest of it has been completely just edited and changed and whatever. But Revelation talks about that there's going to be an apocalypse, there's going to be a tribulation, and then there's going to be a thousand years of peace. After that thousand years of peace, we go into an area, a, a time period called Gog and Magog. And then after Gog and Magog, we what? We ascend. So what people, the Tartarian experts are speculating is that we've already had the a thousand years of peace. And now we're in Gog and Magog, and that was Tartaria. Now, so basically, this means that the fall of Atlantis was the apocalypse. That was the apocalypse. And then there was a tribulation. And then we had Yeshua and Magdalene who gave birth to the Merovingian line, which is the line of Magdalene, the, the Atlantis bloodline. And that leads us into what we call the Dark Ages, which the Tartarian experts say, this is not Dark Ages, this was Tartaria. This was the 1,000 years of peace. We had these buildings that were used for healing, all these like the Arc de Triomphe in Paris or all these, the Marble Arch in London, all these arches were magnets. Um, and this guy does a really good job explaining it that pushed out energy to people. They use sound healing, plant healing. And then after the 1,000 years were over, we had what they called a mud flood. And there's lots of evidence to show that this actually did happen and there was a reset. And then we had all of these world's fairs. So this was at the end of the, you know, during the 1800s, we would say, and all these world's fairs were popping up and these were indoctrination to get people to confuse their history and not remember Tartaria, right? And so, um, and this is because we're in this polarized, if you want to call it Lucifer, whatever, the darkness and the light. And, um, and so anyway, that puts us at Gog and Magog, where a lot of people think we're at the apocalypse. We're not. We're, we're literally going to ascend. And so um, when we look at like the Dogon people, and oh, and by the way, so the real kicker with Tartaria, the real kicker is that um, that means that if you are an American, if you're watching this, doesn't matter if you're black, white, Native American, whatever. Asian, unless you know for sure that your parents immigrated here on an airplane in your lifetime, there's a high probability that how your people got here is not how you've been taught. So there's a high probability criteria <laughs> that my stories of my ancestors coming over on boats isn't necessarily accurate. And I know that's going to be sensitive to people. It's just a theory. 
Um, it's, it, I, I, I um, encourage you to research this for yourself. It's very fascinating. I, like I said, when I was in Washington, D.C., I was like, yep, this is this is a Tartarian town. So that means Washington, D.C. was a place of healing because that's where they would have it was it was peace. It was a time of peace and people healed each other and they used sound therapy, light therapy, all that kind all these therapies. Um, we know that that we are, as the Cassiopeians say, we are in quarantine. Some people want to say we're a prison planet or we've got a firmament over the planet. Um, but if you look at the t- Tartarian stuff. They say, yes, there is kind of like a a quarantine netting. So our sky isn't actually blue. Our sky is actually purple if we had our real sky, which I one of my subscribers pointed this out to me. So we look at Prince, and I've been calling him the prophet known as Prince. His song, 1999, there is a, a, a lyric that says, the sky was turning purple. There were people running everywhere. And so at the point of ascension, what it believes is going to happen is that there is going to be a crowd the, the the quarantine. We're out of timeout, right? We're out, we're out of timeout. <laughs> so, and so the firmament gets pulled off and we actually get to see our real sky, which is purple. And so I know a lot of people have dreams when they like astro travel, say they see a purple sky, not a blue. Um, it's all very interesting. And we know that yeah. there are people that do know the truth. And they a lot of those mus- musicians would kind of put information in songs uh, purple rain about like trying to get you to understand that what you've been told is truth isn't necessarily truth and so this brings us to again to the dogon people so part of the gog and magog the re um the re-education of all of humanity a lot of the re-education of all of you humanity has to do with us being divided they want to divide us by everything they want to divide us by race they want to divide us by gender they want to divide us by sexuality they want to divide us by country When we really look back at our history and the Tartarians, the whole world was Tartaria. So they were all just Tartarians and they just kind of worked together and lived together and loved together and helped each other. And they understood that we had a galactic heritage. And then over the mud flood and the reprogramming, we forgot that. And so what I want to now go back to, so I want everybody to hold that in their mind as as a possibility that our whole history is not what we think it is. But now I'm going to go back to the what we know of the institutionalized history of the Dogon people because their story can can live in both in both timelines and still be the most miraculous thing ever. So the Dogon people are from an area of, of Africa that was called the the Mali Empire. Now, according to the timeline they give us in school, again, take it with a grain of salt. The Mali Empire existed from 1226 to 1675. So it was a very pretty long empire for empire. Yeah, it was a dynasty on that. So they and and where Mali is, guys, because we're going to talk about what what happened was we're going to talk about what happened to separate the the Dogon people. So Mali is located. So Africa has that little hump that comes out of it with uh and morocco is right up there by the strait of gibraltar right that's where you know uh, atlantis wrote about this area atlantis um plato wrote about this area being a very important area of atlantis where the strait of gibraltar is and morocco we now know what is the main religion in morocco islam right is islamic and so just south of that is this mali empire well, we know the Cassiopeians have said this, that when, and we can either say this in the, the timeline they've given us, or we can look at it from the perspective of Tartaria when they were trying to brainwash us. If we look at ancient civilizations all over the world, so re- regardless of whether you are a white person in America whose ancestors are actually from America because of Tartaria or you're from Europe, whatever that might be. We know, as we spoke about last week, that every race we have, every hue of a human, every color is is represented a representative of a galactic heritage. And we're all a mixture of all these galactic heritages. Right. So within this and and the Cassiopeians uh, spoke about this with the Kentuckian people as well. The Kentuckian people came through the portal of Kiev and they brought with them. um, They're from a planet called Kenteca, which got destroyed by the Draco a while ago, and they brought them into Kiev. And they were people that looked like Palladians, looked like me. They were the, the you know, think of river dance. They were like the Celtics. Um, that was their culture. So if we look at all of them, like river dancing. <laughs> 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 so 
in the South, we call it clogging. They were clogging. Uh, <laughs> um, um, and so we look at all these indigenous cultures. And so white people, you, if we look at where white people from, according to the uh, matrix history, white people are from where? They're from Europe, right? So that's a uh, 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 heavily Druid, Celtic, Kentuckian. You've got this more serious in the African region. You've got the Indian. You've got all these different pockets of heritage. And if you go back and look at all, and we're going to talk about the guy who really pointed this out in a minute. All these ancient cultures pretty much were teaching the same thing. They might have had different vocab, like Thoth from the Emerald Tablets was Odin to the Scandinavian crew. Right. It's they have they have might have different names, but they're the same energy. It's the same spiritual being. A lot of them talked about in their art and their hieroglyphics, uh, beings coming from the sky to give them information. Hello. Um, and so what what happened was when especially any of the Abrahamic faiths. So we're looking at Christianity, Islam and Judaism. Now, um, with uh, the Cassiopeians say that those are the most heavily manipulated religions and they've been the ones that have been used to um to to control people and so let's for the white people for example because i know like white people love their christianity your heritage for most of the existence on this planet is druid or celtic pagan as it your your heritage for most of your existence has been your lineage has been pagan okay what happened when the Christian church took over and started colonizing Christianity, they colonized Europe was one of the first places they colonized. Listen, y'all, Christianity didn't spread like wild, wildfire because people just loved Jesus. These people, <laughs> the Druid. It depends, it depends on what version you want to talk about. <laughs> church wants to say it's the good news. They just surrendered to the good news. <laughs> oh, they came in and were like, hey, we have a new religion. You're going to have to give us money to the church and you're going to have to accept this faith. And the Druid people were like, now we're good with our own faith. And they were like, oh, yeah. And they started raping and murdering. And so finally they're like, okay, oh, fine, fine. We'll, we'll be a Christian. We'll be Christian. Just don't hurt us, you know? Well, the same thing was happening with Islam. So let's get back. So you guys understand that with Christianity. Well, the same thing was also happening with the Islamic faith as well. And just so you guys know, two things get two to things. be true. The teachings of Jesus or Yahshua and the teachings of Muhammad could have been very good and awesome and pure. But the institutions could have corrupted them, right? So when I talk about these institutions coming in, I'm not talking about their prophets or their their the people that I'm talking about the institution. There's a difference, right? I think most people know that. So what what happened was the same thing was happened in <laughs> happening in Africa with Islam. And so we know that Morocco now is predominantly Islamic. Well, within the Mali Empire, uh there was a family called the Kieta family. And they were really a dynasty. Like they were the original rulers of the Mali Empire. And when the Islamic invaders came in, most of the Kieta family like surrendered to Islam because I don't blame them. Like if they're blame, they're going to like rape your family and burn you at the stake, then obviously you're going to do whatever you can to survive and protect your kids. But there were a few members of the Kieta family that said, fuck this, we're going to run away. And so what they did is these few members of the Kieta dynasty removed themselves, extracted themselves from the, the part of the Mali Empire that existed then and went south. And they went south into this area. I said to keep, I wrote here, to keep themselves safe, they secured themselves into sta sandstone cliff environment. This meant not only were they protected from the inv these were like 90 mile foot cliffs like there's no way people were going to try to get to them they protected themselves in in this little area so not only did this protect them though but it also kept them pretty cut off from the rest of the world for many 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 generations if we want to say centuries i don't know because we have no idea what the real timeline is so by them being cut being cut off not only did their tribe then grow again into a big nation but they preserved the oral tradition, as Hillis was saying, they orally taught their, their children these stories. And so how we know this is in 1931, 
a French anthropologist named Marcel Griol actually went out looking for these people. Like he knew these people were out there, but they were so, this was 1931, very different, almost a hundred years ago. And so he went out, this is a harsh, it's near the Sahara desert. Like this is a harsh area of the world. And so to actually in 1931, to be like, I'm going to go find these people. Yeah. Well, I want to let you know that probably in 1931, the Saharan desert probably wasn't as bad as it is today because That's back in, you know, one, 200, probably, you know, two, 300 years ago, that area of the world was very lush. And yeah. it was yeah. because of the colonization where that rich desert or well, that place was rich in minerals. It was just a rich place in every sense of the word. Through the colonization, they began to strip the land. And so to strip the land, well, that's what you have left. Because people uh, often have in their minds, too, when you think of Kemet or Egypt, you know, that it was this, you know, barren land. But no, it was a paradise. Uh yeah, it was very lush. That's only, yeah, absolutely. So that's a really good point. So it might not have been as bad as it would be now. But he, he went out and searched for these people and he found them and he, li he lived among them for over a decade. So he didn't just go in and like observe, like he became a part of their society and he studied them and he got to know them. And um, there he realized right away that their religion, their faith was still taught um, through oral tradition. Um, they had their own system of astronomy. They also had their own calendar, which to me was like, ding, ding, ding. I want to see this calendar because if anybody's going to have the correct calendar, it's probably going to be them, right? Um, and they had their own knowledge of anatomy and physiology. So meaning they had their own like medical system. They have, and, and honestly, guys, the complexity of the Dogon people, I'm just giving you the Cliff Notes version. This would take, a lifetime to go through everything this this civilization this group of people they the complexity is unbelievable like unbelievable what they what they know and what they study and what they teach their children so through um through this uh grial realized that their creation stories matched that from the lost empires all over the planet so what do i mean by this so there is a, an entity that the um, they called them the great teachers, the 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 Numo, these great teachers that these Dogon people spoke about. And these Numo were the people that came down. So they were people, entities that came from the sky, but lived in the sea. So they came down in a whirling thunderstorm to Earth. They were humanoid to an extent, but obviously didn't look just like us. And in the daytime, they would live on land and teach the people. But then in the night, they would go to the sea. So this also makes a think of like mermaids. The legends yeah, because, of uh, because when you have a planet like Arcturus and uh, Sirius B that are primary water planets, yeah. Of course, you're going to have to be like, you know, the mermaid or have that ability to adapt to your environment. And when you, I'm interested to hear about the astronomy because that's, that's how they that. learned about the astronomy is from yeah, them. Oh, just wait, just wait, because <laughs> the Dogon people stumped. They stumped the scientists of the world. So the first thing, again, that, that Griol realized was that these Numo people that the Dogon spoke about, these teachers, represent, were very much represented in, like, Western folklore of mermaids. Um, the way they were drawn looked a lot like mermaids. Um, the, in, in Hinduism, there's also deities with a fish tail. And so Griol was like, oh, you got to be shitting me. Like, these, the, this group, this civilization that's been completely cut off from the rest of the world is holding on to information and living and breathing and integrating information that we know all these other pockets of the world used to believe, but don't anymore. How is this, how is this possible? Like, how is it possible? So anyway, so they claimed that these teachers came from Sirius. Now get this, my friends. So again, I said, this was 1931. 
I highlighted this in my notes because I was like, mic drop. This was shocking. As Sirius was not known by the Western astronomers until 1862. So the Western astronomers only figured out Sirius in 1862. But this tribe of, of people who didn't own telescopes or any like modern equipment already knew. They're like, oh, yeah, that's Sirius. Like they knew all about it. They were aligned with it. Not only that, they knew about Sirius B. Now, Sirius A, the Big Mac Daddy, is like the big bright blue star in the sky. But Sirius B we cannot see it without a telescope. Nor Sirius C. Nor Sirius C, which we're going to get to in a minute. So, <laughs> so the Dogon people were telling Griol that there is a planet, Sirius B, that, uh, that moves around That's Sirius around. And um, it's not, they say it's not the big blue one, but the one beside it that can now can only be seen by high powered telescopes. Y'all, you know, when we first saw Sirius B in a high powered telescope, the 1950s, this was 1931. So the Do Dogon people are telling Griol this, that, yeah, there's another planet. We can't see it, but we know because these Numa, these mermaids came down and told us. So that's how we know. That's how we know. They told us there are teachers. They told us this. So they also knew uh, that the size of the Earth, that Sirius B was exactly the size of the Earth. And um, this is where the fish people came from. Like this, uh, the weight of it, they under even knew, which was no way of us even, we didn't have stuff to go up there at that point. Like this was all like shocking that years later, they were proven correct by modern technology. So Griol watched the Dogon people do rituals to a star that had yet to be discovered. They can't see it, but they know it orbits around Sirius A, and its orbit lasts 50 years. So they knew exactly where it was located. They knew it took 50 years in our time for it to move around Sirius, uh, for Sirius B to move around Sirius A. Um, they knew it was made of heavy, dense material. And they also knew that there was a serious C. The which baby. My... Go ahead, sorry. No, I said the baby. <laughs> the baby. And they believed, they told Griol. Now, listen, okay. So let me look at my notes here because. Um... I just want you to go ahead because I believe, if I remember correctly, that. You know, I'll just let you go because I, I'm just thinking of, of what I remember hearing about this connection. But you go ahead. <laughs> so the weight of Sirius. So you remember how I told you they knew that Sirius B was a really heavy planet, like very heavy. And they gave all these measurements of what it was. And, and this was back in 1931. They could not confirm the Dogon people correct until 2005. So 2005 was when we finally were able to say, well, I'll be shit. Shit. They were right. The Dogon people were right. So again, they talked about there was a third planet, a Sirius C, and they told um, they told Griol that this third planet, the smaller planet, took six years to orbit the big planet, Sirius A, the sun of their planet. And that the, the Numa... When they left Earth, instead of going back to Sirius B, they went to Sirius C. So they live on Sirius C now. Yeah. We still can't see. We still have no way. Technology can't find Sirius C because we're not there yet. But if I was a betting person, I would say absolutely it's there because they have not been wrong at all. They haven't been wrong about right. anything. Right. And so from, from what I remember hearing a long time ago, um, and possibly, and now it was like such an obscure place. I doubt I can even find it again. Oh, did I lose you, Hillis? Yes. Oh, I lost you uh, for a minute. Yeah, oh, repeat okay. that because of construction, but repeat that. Got it. So uh, I doubt I can find this information again because it's so obscure. Uh, and it's like one of those little tidbits. If you read it, you say, oh, what? That really happened? And so if I remember correctly, that there was a time when the they were visited 
by the Syrians. And there, there was actually um, that there, some of them made it. They were and they made it with the Dogon, and they actually have uh, actually Syrian uh, bloodline. Yeah, and so that's why that bloodline, you know, the the Dogon people is, is that's you know the physical connection because not only they were made it, but also you know back and forth. And if I and even as I'm feeling into this energy, that some of the actual tribe from Mali from that time were actually invited to go to Syria yeah. Sea. And that's the was the most inhabitable of and the closest uh what's to Earth? I'm looking for? Yes, thank you. <laughs> so our environment we could survive in. Well that I, I, I absolutely believe that because we we've heard of these breakaway civilizations. Have you heard of these breakaway civilizations? No. No. Um, so there are believed to be some breakaway civilizations here on planet Earth already, because another idea is that there's actually land here on Earth we're not aware of, um, which at this point, listen, at this point, nothing shocks me anymore. I'm just like, OK, <laughs> probably. Are you, mean, um, are you talking about inner Earth or someplace else? No, well, there is inner Earth. Um, there is, the, and the Cassiopeians have confirmed that there is an inner Earth. There is an Agartha. I'm talking about actual land on Earth, like where we live. Like there are bodies of land that we don't know about and we haven't been able to see. And I know that a lot of, I've had some pilots reach out to me that they see things and they're not allowed to say anything. They've signed NDAs. So, um, so that wouldn't shock me that there are breakaway civilizations here on our planet, and I'm sure there are breakaway civilizations on other planets as well, especially if we have the DNA particles to be able to ha handle another um, ecosystem. Because according to the Cassiopeians, none of us are, no human being is from this planet. None of us are, are, are from planet Earth. We've all come here one star system came and then another star system came and then another star, and then we all intermated with each other and that's why we have that's why again that's why earth is so powerful is because on planet earth from what i understand we're the only planet that has a white person a black person an asian person and what the galactics know is that's because we we are so powerful because we hold all this information of all these other systems in one planet and that's why they try to divide us is because they don't want us to know how powerful we actually are. And so that would not surprise me if some of the Dogon people had gone back to Sirius. If you look at the Hathor, at Hathor, if you're the Sophia Code, and her sister, she talks about how she was able to bilocate. She lived yeah. both on in, in Egypt and in Sirius. She could bilocate to both places, back and forth. Yeah, as, and, and let's, I just want to us to break that down just a little bit so people have a true understanding of what that is. Now, when people yeah. speak of biolocation, most people, even healers, uh, speak of it in an astral sense. But yeah. it's just the beginning when we start in the space of astral projecting. I haven't gotten there yet. Uh, biolocation is a form of tele teleport, meaning you can physically yeah. teleport your whole entire body back and forth. Absolutely, yes. So she could go back and forth and that there is believed to be, and that is why with the Tartarian stuff, a lot of people believe like the heart of the real Egypt is actually in the southeastern part of the United States, which in my opinion would make sense if you look at, Pan we call it Pantagia. What is that when the earth was one land? Oh, Pangea. Pangea, that's it. And the Florida, if, if you could stick Florida right in the Mediterranean between Africa and Europe, and then Georgia would hook onto Morocco. And so if you're looking at that whole span of being yeah. the land, and then it broke away at, at the, during the mud flood, um, that there could be portals that we like, especially so people believe that Memphis, Tennessee um, is, is there, there in the early 1900s, there were Sphinx in Memphis, Tennessee that they took down. Yeah. So and there are portals. Think, yeah. And that's part of, you know, if you, and then keep in mind, this is you know, the school that we learn to do all these things. So when you are not physically able to teleport, there were the portals that gave you access to go to these different places. I mean, I can't tell you how many books, you know, that I read, and especially after reading Immortables, how many times 
that you that there's talks of portals where you walk through and you're into this you know other land and this other planet or this other part of the planet and so it's just you know the limitations that we have put on ourselves is just astounding and understanding the full limitless capability which i'm in the process of, of doing that's like what else can i do what else can i do what else can i do and so it, it's just in that vein of really you know understanding what the true human or humanity uh heritage is is it based on this planet no it's uh, are we a result of it yes and that result yeah. is the furthering of self-education. Self-education, and this is not necessarily looking at a book, but also connecting to your soul, you know, connecting to those who can be of assistance and service to help you see beyond what is truly really there. And, you know, even though I, I am one of these teachers, but I'm also a student, you know, at the same way, oh, getting there, it's like, what? And so... You know, it's interesting that we're also having this conversation, too, in the middle of the Alliance portal, which is the serious gateway. <laughs> yeah, nothing is nothing is by mistake. I think we're prodded and poked in directions that our guides and our our our, the, our loved ones are pushing us in a direction to 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 rediscover who we really are. And, um, you know, I find it hysterical because we are on a third density planet. And my God. The darkness on this planet has done, I will have to say, a phenomenal job at trying to confuse us. But but how pissed off must they be at all the effort they put in and we're still figuring it out? We're still going back and saying, wait a minute, something's not right. Let's look at the Dogon people because, and I want you guys to think about this too. Like, we know that the United States government basically just admitted that aliens are real and no one's shocked. Everyone's like, okay. <laughs> so, we yeah. know. Like, no shit, dude. Like, we know. But in reality, if we saw a spaceship land, we probably all shit, shit our pants, right? But the Dogon people, to them, seeing these teachers come from the sky was very normal. It was very normal. It was very like, oh, yeah, that mermaid came down to talk to me. Listen, if somebody told me a mermaid talked to them, I would think they were on drugs and I would want to know who their dealer is because it sounds like a good time. You know, because that's... <laughs> I love my plant medicine. I remember my friends in college, my friend went to Amsterdam and this was before like um, transgenderism was like a big thing. And she said she was in Amsterdam and she saw some transgendered people doing a show on the, they were doing like a beautiful show on the bank of the river, but she doesn't know if that was real or if she saw it in her head. Like she doesn't know if that was, this was Amsterdam and Amsterdam has been ahead of the time. So it could have been Anyway, but yeah. It was, was fascinating about all of this is, you know, I'm being guided and reminded of the time in my life from age like nine ish to close to my freshman year in high school. So probably about five years of my life to where my mom was really introducing me to more of African culture, you know, doing, you know, uh, what is called comedic yoga, which I know you are aware of, you know, which is the, the birth of all yoga, at least, you know, that in India, in, in my mind, yeah. and all these other uh, cultural, African cultural references. And I look at that, and what's fascinating is that throughout time especially in the during the 1900s and how there was very little information to be found on any form of african culture and throughout as time progressed like oh well you know you have the the nigerians who scam people and then you have the uh, uh apartheid in south africa and you know people being oppressed still over there and that you know and so all of this this heaviness over that one continent you have yeah. all of that heaviness there where the source of the true information is the rich history and i'm sitting here and it just baffles me i'm like wait how is it that all of this wisdom contained in one place and how we have been conditioned 
to turn away from what we feel in our heart to be true. And some and the people who live on the continent, yeah, they know us. Yeah, they they you know been through the suffering, they've been through the oppression, they've been through it all. But what rings true is their love for where they are, the love for who they, what they are, the love of where they live. And you can't keep that under oppression for too long. And like, it, and now I feel that all the information is coming to the surface, is coming to the light, and how the truth of the universe, the birth of this planet, has come to be because you talk about all the things, you know, such as command, and you talk about the Tower of Babel where all the the races live together and, and all these things. It all happens there. You know, we and, and until you know, it didn't happen anymore. <laughs> you know? I I often think too that if we were to have an alien invasion, all of a sudden the earthlings would get along. <laughs> Because all of a sudden we realize, oh shit, we literally are brothers and sisters. Like, yeah, yeah. you know, it's, it's funny. <laughs> I, I'm I'm in the midst of rewatching one of my favorite shows from the early two thousands called Heroes. It's one of my favorite shows, and I'm and people I, who have special hidden abilities. I'm trying yeah. to remember. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. The show with, yeah, that's that's the show where people, you know, whether if they're teenagers or adults, they discover they have these abilities. And I um, started season three, and it's the bad guy, you know, the villain. And it turns out that the villain is related to the star of the show. So they end up, so now they're brothers. So they kind of hate each other, but they're related. And, uh, and I think about this, say, isn't that like life? You know, you the, the person starts out as their enemy you hate them you despise them and and, and everything you do every everything you can to stop them and, and all kind of things and, and, and thinking about this on a cultural scale you know but yeah come to find out that that person you're related to or this race you're related to the end up being your best friend your best ally in all of this because the one of the things that uh i was told as a kid <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know why this is, rings true, is that, you know, after you make friends with the bully, you know, you, you, you go, you have your fight, you beat up the bully and everything. The bully wants to be your friend because they know how you are. They know how you react. They know all these things. And so it's, it's almost like your enemy becomes your friend because they sometimes know you the best. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, well, it's so funny. I was just filming with Catherine Edwards and I said, I think we're all more alike than we are different. I think I said that to you too. Like we, we, we yeah. more, and the Dogon people understood. I, I don't think they, they were hesitant when um, oh. this white dude came to their tribe. They welcomed him and allowed him because they, they know the truth of humanity and they know that we're all, we all come from. I mean, Hillis, you just said you've got, so here, like, you know, you have, celtic in you as well and you have serious in you and like every person watching you've got all these different shades these hues of yourself that come from galactic heritage and we all have it all of us and so we're these was walking hodgepodge you know like in in the animal kingdom like if you look at dogs for example for example <laughs> even though full red dogs are the most expensive they're usually not the healthiest because yes. they've been very, very inbred but if you look at the mutt the mutt lives the longest and is the healthiest because it's carrying all the traits of, of all these different breeds. And so that's us as, as earthlings, we, we carry this power that we haven't, we did know we had at one time looking at Tartaria, but we forgot. And, um, you know what I was thinking, Hillis, I don't, do you ever watch Aquarius rising Africa? I haven't. You have to send me that. Talk to, I do their show twice a week. I'm going to talk to Shanti and see if we can do you, me and Shanti because Shanti has studied the um, co uh, the continent of Africa a lot in the, in the history. And there are apparently um, pictures, paintings of basically probably what would have been Tartarian times when there were black kings and white people bowing before black kings. And they've gotten rid of this information that there of were. Yeah. And so and she talks a lot about. So I, I'm going to see. I'm going to text her and see if she 
would want to do a round table with us and talk about this because she's done a lot of, of deep diving into the, the and of course she lives in Africa, but she's done a lot of deep diving into the forgotten history of Africa. And she was the one that really got me into Tartaria too, to start looking at Tartaria. Right. Um, but the, you know what I, I, what's fascinating about all of this and just getting a bit emotional, even just thinking about it, about this race talk. You know, you know, being, you know, a fair skinned black person, you know, I've always heard the thing, you well, you're not black enough or you're or you've been whitewashed and all these things. You no, know, I'm hearing as I grow up. And and I know one time I know my my mom and my aunt was just joking, but it was just one of those things I had to let them know, say that kind of hurt. So like we were all out at the restaurant. And my mom and my aunt were dark than that. And they uh, said to me, said, hey, you can go over there and get that, that person's attention because you can pass for being one. And I looked at them, I'm like, no. And I know they were, I know it was just in a playful manner. But the thing is, for people, especially now, there are a lot of uh, multicultural, multiracial people on the planet. And those people, don't care so much about, you know, white, black, orange, purple, Mexican, Puerto Rican, Dominican, uh, you know, whatever, Irish, you know, European, they don't care about that anymore because they identify as at all. And yeah. when we get to the, the space of identifying as all, as human, then we can really step into the next phase of, uh, of remembering who we are, the next, next phase of ascension. You know, because all this, Sensationalism, you know, sensationalization of what just occurred in Montgomery, Alabama. I mean, I'm done with all this. I mean, it's just, it's just the whole idea of us being different, of just by how we appear, by us being different by how we talk, by us being different by how we look, you know, physically, mentally, emotionally, all of it. Personally, I'm done with because that's not yeah. who we are. You know? No, we're everything. We're and why can't you just be Hillis? You know, it's it's interesting. Exactly, that's who I am. <laughs> and I think about that with like you know when you grow up with a group of people, um, you stop seeing. Like I had a friend who was a little handicapped growing up, um, and she walked differently than the rest of us. But I would forget as a kid yeah, because it's not she, important. Her. It was just her. It was, I'm not going to say, I keep trying. I'll call her Jane. It was just Jane. Like it was just Jane, my friend Jane. Like I didn't see that anymore. I had um, one friend and I went to a predominantly white school, but I had one friend who was Muslim, who was from, her parents were from Northern India. And over time, it, we'd never even, no one in my class ever made note. I don't think we even noticed that she didn't look like us. Like it was just her. It was, that was just our friend. Like it didn't matter. You know, it didn't, we didn't care. You know, right. you look at kids that way, like one of my, I sent it, I have a, a friend, I sent this picture to, it was these two kids in kindergarten, a white kid and a black kid. And they wanted to get their hair cut exactly the same. So the teacher wouldn't be able to tell them apart. And like, to be that innocent, <laughs> to That's be that innocent, you know, to be like a, a black, they're best friends and one's black and one's white. And they had this plan. They went, told their mom in kindergarten, they want to get their hair cut the same so they could trick their teacher so their teacher wouldn't be able to tell them apart. Like yeah. how innocent is that? that, they, know, don't, that is, they don't see. And I love that because you know one of the greatest quotes is that we we're taught to hate. We're taught to, we're taught all these things by action, which is one of the reasons why when I work with clients, that is that like we have to then begin to help them to unlearn everything that they've learned through the course of their life because we're taught all these things. And you know, I appreciate. You know, people who deep dive into their own culture. I appreciate people who want to understand their culture, their history, their humanity. I appreciate all of that. But for me, right now in my life, that doesn't matter now. That, I mean, I'm, you know, black, I'm Irish, Celtic, uh, whatever. No, you're I'm not always... the juju in you. Like, if you, yeah. you're kind of like the most potent parts of the Irish, Celtic stuff, man, that's the land of, like, Leprechauns and portals. Yeah. Holy I mean, when I tell people I'm Irish, they say, no, you can't be Irish. I'm like, one, 
what don't you see my freckles and two of you would saw me when I was young I had red hair come on you can't get any more Irish than that <laughs> I have, a, I have a female friend here in Atlanta who's black, and she has Irish in her as well. And when her hair grows out, there's a red tint to it. It's really cool. It's really cool to see that that yeah. um, coming out in her. And she talks about that, like the Irish man. My friend, my Peruvian friend, Cindy, she has Irish in her too. You know, she's mostly yeah. Peruvian. But she's got Irish and I'm like that that is like a that's like a although I will say and I don't I don't mean to offend any Irish people but y'all really aren't white you're green because they're so pale that they're well, I, that's some, the thing. I, I tell people I was like I, I I don't I don't like going out and bite some in the bite some because I burn it's like no you don't I'm like yeah I sunburn easily fresh <laughs> Exactly, and I and I like thanks, Dad. Thanks for Irish. <laughs> so Irish it's, no, I, it's so it's so. Well, have you seen? There's a video going around, and it's the most adorable thing. And it's these little kids, and they're trying to figure out race. You can tell they're like kind of confused by it. And this white girl, they told her she's white, and she's very upset because she's not. She keeps putting pointing to her arm into a white paper, and she's like, "This isn't white." She's like, "That's white. This isn't white." And they're like, but no, that's that's your identification. She's like, no, but that's not white. That that's white. This isn't white. And finally, they go, fine. Then what color are you? She goes, peach. Uh, <laughs> I like it. You know, it, it, it's interesting because you know we go around the planet, and uh, it was this. I can't remember the young lady's name, but it was a young lady who contacted uh, Johnson and Johnson. And wanted the skin tone bad news. And I'm like, that's a big deal. But when I was a kid, you just got a band aid. And yeah, I didn't think about it being skin tone. It doesn't, band aids never match my skin tone. Right. And so now I think about it. And I don't know how to feel about that. I mean, yes, it's an amazing accomplishment. Yes, I, I applaud her for that. But at the same time, you know, how valuable is it? You know, I know when I was, you know, yeah. is that, that and, and then too, when someone else did, um, what was it? The skin tone Crayolas. Now that, that was a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. I mean, you know, cause growing up as a kid, I mean, when I was using Crayola, I think I was using like yellow and brown to try to find my color. But you know, it's, it's just these little nuances of really trying to understand what's important to you and what you identify with. And that's the reason why I bring up these little stories is because not everything is about race. It's how we try to find something to identify ourselves with, which is why it gets to a certain place in my life personally or a certain age where the identification of who I am is becoming less and less important. It's about yeah. who I am on a soul level. And, soul you know, soul. yeah, and when you find, when you know, like you talked about earlier, when you know yourself on a soul level, nothing else matters. You know, right. it's, it's all That's about right. what's in here, you know, what's in the heart, what, what does the soul want to, want the message to be? Yeah, it, absolutely. Absolutely. And you're absolutely right. At some point, it's it's a tired story, right? I think a lot of people. It's my my friend. <laughs> um, very tiring. You know, I've been yeah. hearing the story since I was since I could hear, remember, listen, talk. So yeah, listen. close to fifty years, I've been hearing the story. I I know I, I'm saying that you want, like getting a like lighter skin, but then white people want to get darker skin. It's like it's just no one's ever when when I'm in India, I have to bring I make sure I bring my own lotion because all the the lotions in India have bleach in them. I don't need to be bleached in my skin. Are you kidding? I'm already white. Like so, I have to make sure I. Oh I when I go to shops and I'm shopping, they're like, "Oh, it has bleach in." It. Yay, good. I'm like, I'm already, I don't need bleach. <laughs> like, what are you? about you know See, so you and th this example i mean this comes from conditioning you know yeah. and, well and i will say so with and, the indian like a self-acceptance i'm sorry in indian culture what it shows is a status so if you are a lighter skinned indian person and that shows you're from a higher caste because you don't have to labor in the sun 
So I know. And listen, when I'm in India, I, I, I lay out on the roof to get, to try to get more sun because I'm crazy. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, um, you know, it's like, we're all trying to have, I think we're all just trying to find, I, okay. So I remember one time in college, my boyfriend's friend, my boyfriend at the time, his friend was visiting and um, my boyfriend at the time grew up in South Africa. He's a white guy from South Africa, but his friend was, was mixed. His one white parent, one black parent. So kind of light skin, just like you, Helen. And so we're sitting around smoking pot and you know, you come up with either the worst ideas when you're stoned or the best ideas. And so we're sitting around and he goes, I think in a hundred years time, we're all just going to be brown. <laughs> <laughs> but he wasn't too far off. Like white people want to get to get tanner, the Indian people wanting bleach. Like we're all looking for that same color, just to be that same color. Well, um, eventually it may be like that. I mean, you see, all, especially now with all the the multiracial kids and the multiracial now teenagers and then soon to be adults, it's going to be like that with all of us going to have, it's like, I want your curly hair. No, I want your curly hair. No, I want your spray hair. Well, it's not going to matter if it's going to be the same after a while. Yeah. Well, it's, I, I'm, I'm just saying that I'm like, yeah, you know, the fun, the, the prettiest, in my opinion, the prettiest races when they co-mingle together and create a child is Asian and black. Those I, babies, they are breathtakingly beautiful. They Those call babies. Them Blasians. Oh, Blasians. <laughs> they, well, those Blasians are beautiful. Like they are striking. <laughs> They're like striking when you say it's, it takes your breath away when you see, when you see, actually looking back on it, I feel like, every race when they have a, like a white person a black person they usually have a breathtakingly beautiful child you know yeah, it's like know. the all the races just come together and yeah. to make this one person this one human and um and so it's uh it's i will tell you guys a really funny story one of my really good friends here in atlanta she's not on social media although she's a very successful chef so i really want to get her on my channel because she's built her own business from nothing she's black she's my really good friend and she used to practice with me before lockdown when that studio where I taught at shut down and I would say to her all the time I won't say her name but I would say to her I'd look at her feet because I see people's feet all day and I'll be like you have white girl feet I was like I'm sorry you got white girl feet I don't know where your ancestors are from but those are some white girl feet <laughs> she'd be like no I'm, I'm pretty black I was like girl those are white those are white girl feet I know white girl I know feet I know feet I'm a <laughs> yoga teacher I know feet and she ended up doing her 23 and me and I got a text from her randomly and she was like Bryce I am 30% English. <laughs> I told you it's all on your feet. You got white girl feet. <laughs> That's hilarious. That's funny. <laughs> that white girl foot coming out. So anyway, it's but we're all just, I mean, I've looked at my, I did my 23 in me. I mean, I've got Coptic Egyptian in me. I've got Greek in me. I, I got a lot of Greek in me and I had no, I, even my mom was like, where the hell did that come from? I don't know. I was like, I don't know, milkman. I don't know. Uh, but, <laughs> <The> um, <milkman. laughs> I was like, I knew English, I knew French, I knew German, I knew Scandinavia. Those things I already knew. But then when those things like Coptic Egyptian, Greek pop up, that was a surprise. Like that's, that I, I did not expect to see that. Like, you know, in a lot, it was a pretty high percentage. And, um, you know, and so it's, you start to see that and you're like, wow, there's so much more to you explore. Know, yeah, you know what's making me think of right now? They have the ability to read our DNA, where we are, or where our lineage is from on this planet. I wonder if they are tinkering with the ability to see where we are outside of this planet. I think so. I think that's my, you know, I did my 23 and me kind of stupidly and taught, my boyfriend was a little bit upset. He was like, now they have your DNA. Um, I think so because I think blood types give a lot of indication of yeah. where your DNA is from. And I think they're looking to see like, what, like I'm O negative, which is um, nothing's in my, I have no antigen, no rhesus factor. So that get, that's the Magdalene, the Merovingian line. And like, like my boyfriend's A negative. So he has the A antigen, which is very Palladian and with no rhesus. And so I think yeah, that they- I forget what mine is. I have to ask. You can do. You can get on uh, Amazon. They have these little tests that you can take there. You just prick your finger and you and it shows you, and it it works pretty quickly. 
oh, maybe I'll do that. Pretty quickly. Um, and so I, first of all, as a female, if your Reese is negative as a female, it's more important for females to know than males because of, of childbearing. Um, females are age, like for me and the wildest thing. So this is why I think this, I was, when I was studying blood types, like right when I first opened my channel and guys, if I, I will find that video and I'll put that in the description box below. Um, I was researching RH negative versus RH positive and like the big, there's lots of differences like between the two and the, um, one of the scientists said that RH negative people were a different species. He classified them as a different species. I'm RH negative. So what that means for me is a well, my sister's also RH negative and all three of her children, because her husband's RH positive, so they had to monitor her pregnancies because an RH woman, a negative woman has a hard time carrying an RH positive baby because it's, it doesn't recognize the rhesus factor. And so you have to now medically, they can give you shots to help you carry the baby. So your body doesn't abort it. But, um, but back in the day, it was virtually impossible for a woman RH negative to carry full term an RH positive baby. And there's only 15% of the population is RH negative. Um, and so it's a very small, all of our presidents have been RH negative. Um, the Royal family's RH negative. So there's all these, that conspiracies you know, that it's what they look for. So I know the Royal family looks for O negative because there's nothing in your blood. And so they, I think they, their theory is that, and it's true. O, RH negatives do tend to have more psychedelic experiences without being high. <laughs> Like we see ghosts all the time. Um, and I know that the back of our eyes. So I have astigmatism is what it's been labeled out medically. But RH negative people, it's not really astigmatism. So the back of your eye, like through the eye, RH positive have a circle and we have a diamond. So it's shaped differently. So that means that I perceive light differently than someone who is RH positive. By the way, okay, my eyes. Now, now I'm going to do my, my blood test. I'm going to go order my... Amazon. Do it. I, I I have a suspicion of what you are, but I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to let you do it. I already have a suspicion of sneaking. <laughs> I call my boyfriends. My boyfriend would make fun of me all the time because I do have one of my my great great grandfather was born into the English royal family, so I do. That's where it comes from. My O negative. My boyfriend would make fun of me all the time. He'd be like, you're just a lizard person. Like, like he's like, the FBI is going to come for you now. And then I kept looking at him and Hillis knows my boyfriend. I'd be like, you're, you kind of have some of the RH negative side effects too. He was like, no, I'm just sorry. And, and he did his blood tests. And sure enough, sure enough. Uh, <laughs> sure enough. I was hilarious. like, karma, baby, karma. Um, so, um, but yeah, it's interesting. It gives you a, a kind of an indication, but I think you're right. I think they are looking to see, because I think the powers that be know the truth. Yeah. I, I mean, I mean, when you have, you know, visitation, you know, from two, three hundred years ago, you know, from uh, one thought and who holds the richest amount of history, then of course, you know, there's going to be things that you will never find in. There'll be little tidbits here and there that you, that so often you know, people will find it hard to believe anyway. And so it's just only a matter of time before what's true, you know, the real to allow itself to be known unless you are able to tap into the energetic frequency and, you know, look inside yourself and connect to the ethers and say, okay, well, ask the question and allow yourself to receive the answer that will be delivered to you and know that that is true for you. You know, it may not be true for someone else, but the reason why it would be true for you is because you've asked it, you're inquisitive about it, and you are connected to your consciousness, the source consciousness, and that awareness that sits in you. Absolutely. Hold your arms up again, Hillis. Show your tattoos. Right. I don't know. If oh, wait. <laughs> oh, yeah. I don't have my green screen on. I don't know if I've told you this before, but I saw your arm and I was like, oh, my God. So my boyfriend's covered in tattoos as well. Do you know uh, what they say? Have I told you what they say about tattoos? Uh, you told me once, but I can't remember right now. Well, apparently, um, a lot of the uh, galactic beings our cousins from the stars, uh, they, they speak in a light language, right? Which we, people believe Sanskrit is a light language. Like some of these old languages are light language. 
probably a lot of people African languages, light languages. And so people who their soul has been on other planets, most of the existence and just like maybe the, the theory is they are addicted to tattooing because on other planets, their light language is on their arms. Yeah, I'm not done yet. There's, so I, I, there's some more that I have to get. But yeah, this is all this uh, energy that I work with. I think that's on my arm right now. Yeah, it's your language. That's uh, yeah. my boyfriend. His uh, right arm is completely, it's one thick sleeve, just completely no skin left. It's just one sleeve. Yeah, I've thought about doing a sleeve, but I'm like, eh. I don't know. I, I still like my skin, but like, God. Now, when he started doing his other arm, I was a little bit like, oh, leave some skin. But his other arm is just some like tribal stuff. Um, and one of his legs is com covered. Um, but the rest of it, you know, he, he, I was like, just, just leave me some skin to see. But yeah, no, they say it's because and he's very, woo, like very, he, he very much um, has had a lot of experiences with off, off worlders and, uh, so I was like, that makes a lot of sense that like people would be missing that. You're missing that light language. And so you. Yeah. Try oh, yeah. No, I'm not done. <laughs> there's, there's more to be done. Tattoos are addictive. I've got a couple. They're, they're, they're definitely, there's an adrenaline rush that happens when you get that tattoo. So um, it's, it's also misty. And let me think about it, Hillis. If every human being in the world actually sat and contemplated, that we are literally within your body. You are a walking antenna of all these different galactic oh, yeah. heritage. And we all are like how much, I think like 60% of these like hate crimes would go away just overnight because well, yeah, people not only that, but I mean, when you think about it in a 3d sense, and I've always said this, that if everyone on the planet was simply provided for if they have their basic needs met, it will, it will be it will go away, and that's the problem. No one wants to. You know, we talk about you know brotherly love and helping your fellow man and doing this and doing that, but most of us just talk. Yeah. And if people actually lived up to that, then yeah, it would it would just be done. You know, if people like you or me had you no know, billion dollars or a trillion dollars yeah i wouldn't mind giving that yeah no I've, I've said that i would always every time in my life i've ever been in a position where i can make lots of money or i've always said that to god or the universe like whatever you give me i will make sure i never take it for granted and i always give a percentage back that i always make sure somebody i used to do that um when I had my corporate job, when I was a uh, director of yoga for wellness centers of America and I had a really good income coming in, I would, every paycheck, I would take a lot, some cash out. And I would just, when I would drive through Atlanta, if I saw someone like the woman who worked the toll, I had to go through a toll every morning. Like one day I just gave her a wad of money. It was near Christmas. And I was like, I'm paying it, just pay it forward. Like you, yes, to be able to give forward to your fellow man. We collected blankets one Christmas and went off and to the, where the homeless people live in Atlanta and just brought them a bunch of blankets and coats to make sure that they were warm enough. And if everybody was doing that, then, then I think we would prove the controllers wrong. We would take their power away from them because, you know, we're not going to play their game. And, um, and we all, and I just like, I really, with I mean, the Dogon people are such an example of like, we all, because as Griel figured out, like their story is the same as the white people's story. It's the same as the Indian people's story. It's the same as Famous, Native yeah. Americans. They just it's hold a, on. To it's, it. the, it's just the story. And, and we are so desperate to attach to something for us to identify with that we, you know, could make it our own. But the story is just the story. When you yeah. strip everything else out of it, that's all that's left. Yeah, it's just a story. Uh, my friend Shanti calls it, it's the drama. It's the drama of it all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I will say, though, to end on a comical note, because, Hillis, I know you're from Chicago, but live in Florida now. There is a comedian who, she's a black lady. She's, I can't remember her name. I'm going to have to try to find it and send it to you, a clip. She did. She got. She's from Atlanta. But she got moved to New York City. So she starts to set off saying, I'm from Atlanta, but I live in New York because I'm successful. <laughs> so basically, she got moved to New York to write comedy sketches. And the first thing she talks about is how she's in New York. 
and all of a sudden there's a snowstorm. And she's thinking, because in the South, if they even mention snow, everything closes down. But she, there's a snowstorm, and they're like, no, you have to come to work tomorrow. And she goes, but Jesus don't want me to come to work tomorrow. It's just the way she said it. But Jesus don't want me to come to work tomorrow. And then they say, <laughs> they, I love it. Any Southerner can relate to that. She's like, you know, people in New York always say, like, you must be so happy to live here because the South is so racist. She's like, I hate New York. I love Atlanta. And she's like, oh, really? She goes, if anything... The North is more racist than the South because they divide up their white people. She goes, I live in a Greek neighborhood. You know what Greek people and Italian people are in the South? White. Guys, <laughs> 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 divide up your white people. <laughs> you don't even go that far in the South. You're just black or white. That's it. You know? So anyway, it was That's just hilarious. Hysterical. It's hysterical the way she said it because she's such a proud Southerner living in New York. You know, um, she and she talks about New York. They just put a bunch of bridges on islands and said, "Oh, y'all got to come see this." And like everybody, <laughs> moved to New York. Um, you know, she's like, "I'm from Atlanta. You're welcome. I'm from Atlanta. You're welcome." Like she, it was hysterical. But the way she said that, she was like, "You know what a Greek person is, an Italian person is in the South, white." <laughs> you know, just, that's hilarious oh, oh my god we can just laugh at the stupidity of ourselves you know um it's it's anyway but i do know and i will say too something comical about the 23 and me i've heard so many stories and you could read on reddit these stories of people who are so proud they think they're like italian or they think they're french and then they do their 23 and me and it turns out they're not that at all. And so families will break up and have arguments because they're not, they're actually German. You know, they're not, you know, it's just very funny. But anyway, but yeah, it's just the drama. It's just the story, your soul and your experience in this avatar, are all that matters. And you are so, I say this all the time on my channel, Hillis, like you are the storm. We are so much more powerful than we could ever even imagine. Um, and that is what they don't want you to know. And so take a, take an example from the Dogon people and hold on to what you know to be truth and let everything else just pass you by because yeah. that inherent DNA knowledge is all that matters. So I know we've gone over an hour now, guys. So, um, I'm looking forward to our next discussion. Um, oh, the Dogon people. One thing I'll end on too, is they have these incredible masks. These masks mm -hmm. that are an homage to the people the beings that came from sirius b to teach them and all of humanity all those years ago mm. how cool is that so and they know the dogon people know no matter what your skin color is we're all from the same place we're all cousins yeah. so you know anyway guys i'm gonna put all of hillis's links down in the description box below make sure you are subscribed to hillis's channel and all of his contacts for any type of healing you may need a lot of you probably recognize Hill hillis from the asia journey um and so we want to get his channel up and running because he's got a lot of incredible information to offer the world as we go through this shit show that we're all in together <laughs> I'm going to Venus next life, guys. I've already booked my ticket. I'm going to Venus. <laughs> it's going to be a life of squaws. And so, so <laughs> we, is there anything you want to end with today, Hillis? Just get in touch with who you are. And when you allow for that truth to resonate, nothing else matters. And if you live in New York, I will be doing an in-person two-day workshop at one of my favorite places in Brooklyn, Maha Rose. You can click the link in the description for details. It is going to be on November 10th and 11th. Well, if you're not in New York, you just want to come hang out with me for a weekend, let's do it. That's awesome. That makes me kind of want to see where I'm going to be in November. I love New York. See, I actually love New York. I think New York is magical. <laughs> I'm a, I love Broadway. I love the dance. And I'm, listen, listen, if we all lived like a musical, there would be no more war. If we all just started tap dancing and doing jazz hands, <laughs> it would end all the violence. <laughs> so, <laughs> we all just tap dance our way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Out of situation so anyway guys well, we will talk to you all very very soon thank you guys so much for all the support we hope you're all doing very very well as always please leave us your thoughts and your comments down in the comment section below and we'll see you all next week bye everybody